Hi everyone, I'm Eric from Lonesome Reader and I'm in a slightly different location here because I'm currently on holiday in Sardinia with a group of friends. We're staying at this um, villa out in the countryside so I'm like surrounded by uh, these beautiful mountains and have this sort of mineral pool uh, that I get to swim in uh, which is really lovely. And um, so during this week I'm doing a lot of reading and uh, so I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to do Sean the Book Maniac's epigraph tag, which is his original tag that he created, uh, which is all surrounding um, the uh, epigraphs of books, um, which are sort of quotes at the starts of books, which um, can mean a lot of different things and be used in different ways in relation to the actual text that the author writes in the book. And um, I urge you to watch Sean's um, original video about this because he goes into detail about the different ways that epigraphs can be used in books. Um, and I was really honored that he made this tag in response to a book video of mine of a reading wrap-up where I was talking about the epigraphs of two books that I had read and um, sort of my feelings about the books in relation to those epigraphs. And I think it's a really interesting idea because usually epigraphs are something that we read at the beginning of a book um, and then don't really think that much about again afterwards um, when getting into the actual text of the book. And so um, it's, yeah, it's a sort of interesting chance to really focus on that and see like what the author might have meant by putting this quote or um, a, a line at the start of a book to really set off the tone of how that book will be read. And um, so one of the definitions that he talked about was of how an epigraph can be a sort of lens through which uh, the story of a book is like understood. And so the book that I'm going to be talking about is Joyce Carol Oates' new book of short story called Night Gaunts. And now sadly my copy, my advanced reading copy um, that I took along with me is quite water damaged now because yesterday I took it on a, um, we went on a sailboat ride for the day and uh, we we stopped off at this island and so I was like reading it on this island, um, you know, it's sort of like idyllic settings but then like <laughs> as, as uh, you know, with many uh, like best laid plans, um, things went wrong when we sailed back to the mainland of Sardinia and uh, got caught in a storm, this like really bad um, thunderstorm <laughs> and uh, it was raining horribly and everything got completely soaked inc including um, my bag which included this book um, so now it's very water damaged but it's still readable and it's fine but it's just uh, yeah really beaten up and so you know I'm a huge fan of Joyce Carol Oates. I'm always talking about this and um, she's particularly fascinating as a writer of short stories um, because quite often in her short stories she'll use them as experiments or sort of responses um, to other writers and so this book um, has the subheading Night Gaunts and Other Tales of Suspense and she quite often writes these sort of genre fiction, um, genre fiction merged with literary fiction uh, which uh, uses sort of suspense or gothic elements to write about real world problems and um, this book is a, a great example of that. So in this book um, the term night gaunts is actually taken from an H.P. Lovecraft poem. Uh, so she, in before um, the book of short stories, she um, includes this poem of night gaunts. I thought it's particularly interesting looking at this epigraph because it's a book of short stories, so obviously they're stories she wrote at um, lots of different times. And um, But she's talked in the past how when she um, puts together books of short stories of all these stories which have been published in different publications, how she tries to arrange them in a way that says something in itself, like the, the arrangement of the short stories will say something sort of as a whole, as well as the individual stories obviously making statements and creating um, these uh, particular stories in with a particular context. And, uh, and so it's quite interesting that um, she included this um, poem by H.P. Lovecraft because H.P. Lovecraft, if you don't know, he was a writer that's particularly um, fascinating and particularly problematic uh, because he wrote, uh, he was a writer of the early 20th century that wrote a lot of 
gothic fiction, um, which was published in periodicals and uh, was never really collected in his lifetime. He had a relatively short life. He, he died um, fairly early uh, of cancer. And, uh, but he, um, he was never very successful in his lifetime. He, he died almost um, completely impoverished and his writing didn't achieve any particular fame in his lifetime. And it was only posthumously that his writing was collected together and he was um, sort of, he, he had some ardent admirers who really uh, championed his writing. And I've never read his short stories um, myself, uh, but I've read about them and read about Joyce Carol Oates's, um criticism uh, talking about them. And so he, like, he's particularly interesting because he sort of internalized a lot of these um, fears and paranoias and created these like fabulous worlds surrounding them. And um, night gaunts is a term um, that he gave to his nightmares when he was a boy. Uh, he would have these nightmares and he gave the, the terrors which plagued him a physical presence as like a creature, a faceless creature that haunted him. And he was a particularly problematic writer uh, because he was like quite straightforwardly racism and elitist in his um, stories. So in uh, Joyce Carol Oates remarked in a um, 1996 review in the New York Review of Books, um, she, she reviewed uh, a biography of him and his short stories and some of his published letters and she uh, wrote of him how strange it was to know that Lovecraft was unflailingly kind, patient, generous, unassuming and gentlemanly in his personal relations yet in keeping with his Tory sensibilities an anti-Semite despite his deep affection for Sonia Green uh, who is his wife and other Jewish friends, uh, racist and all-purpose Aryan bigot. Uh, so uh, it's like very strongly acknowledged that uh, he had these like horrible beliefs, um, yet his imagination was really fascinating uh, because of the way that he manifested all of his um, fears and uh, paranoias in his fiction. So the poem um, Night Gaunts um, that she uh, reproduces at the beginning of this book is out of what crypt they crawl i cannot tell but every night i see the rubbery things black horned and slender with membranous wings they come in legions on the north wind swell with obscene clutch that titillates and stings snatching me off on monstrous voyagings to gray worlds hidden deep in nightmares well over the jagged peaks of thok they sweep heedless of all the cries I try to make, and down the nether pits to that foul lake where the puffed shogoths splash in doubtful sleep. But ho, oh, if only they would make some sound or wear a face where faces should be found. And so, um, sorry, the light is coming over uh, the mountains and so um, I might be drowned out by the, the, uh, the sunlight coming up. Um, so, but that's the, um, the introductory poem that starts this collection. Um, so I'm gonna move the camera now because um, I feel like I'm being sort of drowned out. Okay, so this is a slightly better spot um, where it's a bit darker, but um, the light will be a bit more consistent. Um, you know, this is the sort of perils of filming outdoors um, as Sean often finds when he's filming his videos outdoors. Um, you can't really control the elements around you. So anyway, back to um, the book of short stories. Uh, so uh, yeah, so this is that's the poem um, that starts off this collection. And it's particularly interesting because um, it sort of describes uh, these these nightmare demons that um, will plague us sometimes. And, um, and I think uh, why she uses this is because Joyce Carol Oates is particularly good at getting at um, the uh, sort of psychological reality of her characters in that um, they're so sort of steeped in their subjective existence that um, they can't really uh, see clearly anymore, you know, and sometimes um, s start to slightly see things in a deranged way because they get so embroiled in their uh, emotions and passions. And so um, these um, short stories, uh, uh, there's one short story at the it's actually the last short story in the collection that's actually called Night Gaunts, um, which I, uh, is obviously a particular 
play on H.P. Lovecraft's um, fiction. And it's interesting how, um, like I said, a lot of Joyce Carol's short stories will particularly, um, especially like reference uh, works of art or works of fiction. Like um, she uh, published a collection of short stories in the 70s, I think, called Marriages and Infidelities. Some of those stories were a um, play on classic uh, short stories by Henry James and Chekhov, um, where she kept the same title of the story but wrote a kind of modern version of it or an, an interpretation or like a play on the themes and ideas of those stories. And, um, and she's done this in her work quite a lot. And, um, and, and it's particularly interesting that, um, so I've read the first book, uh, the first short story in this book, uh, which is called A Woman in the, w uh, the Woman, The Woman in the Window. This uh, references specifically an Edward Hopper painting um, that he painted in 1925, I think, called 11 a.m. And, uh, and it's uh, particularly fascinating uh, because she, Joyce Carol Oates also published a book of short stories earlier this year, like this is her second book of short stories of the year, and um, her book of short stories from earlier this year is called Beautiful Days, and the cover image that was used for that book of short stories is um, this Edward Hopper painting, 11 a.m. I'll, um, I'll look up the, the photo of that, um, I don't have the book with me, um, but uh, it's, yeah, this is it, it's Beautiful Days. And so you can see it's a woman um, naked, uh, sat at the window looking out, and she's wearing a pair of shoes, nothing else. And um, it's her her face is sort of covered or masked, and uh, and so you you can't tell by her expression what she's feeling or what she's thinking. Um, you just have to um, sort of. Uh, imagine why this woman might be sitting naked in a window and the title the title of the painting is 11 a.m. and so you know that's an odd time it's not like late at night um, it's not very early in the morning it's almost midday and so it's sort of like a time of the day when everyone would be at work um, would be in the full course of their day but she sat there naked in the window and so um, this the first story in this collection imagines why um, this woman might be sitting in the window naked and Joyce Carol imagines her um, as a, a woman of I think in the 50s who's a secretary um, waiting there for her lover who is her boss and um, who keeps telling her that he's going to leave his wife and um, be with her and so it's sort of that old story of an affair um, where a um, the lover is sort of kept waiting for the married person to um, leave their partner and be with them. And, um, and she gets into, she sort of flips back and forth between the perspectives of um, these two characters, the, the lover and the married man, um, uh, to show their different perspectives of why they're sort of locked in this relationship which bec has become um, you know started as an affair started really passionately and which has become incredibly toxic and thinking about the um, the epigraph for um, this like I think it's really interesting because then you think about the painting and you think about the faceless woman and how um, she uh, has was to the married man um, this thing of um, beauty of fascination um, that he fell in love with and that he lavished with gifts. He gave her an expensive apartment to live in and money and takes her out to um, expensive meals occasionally, but frequently disappoints her. And, um, and so she's this sort of like faceless person trapped in the window, um, staring out, waiting for him. And equally on the other side, um, he's become this um, source of terror for her that she's become come to loathe because um, he's disappointed her so frequently that she starts to feel murderous towards him but she can't quite bring herself to do it because she lives in hope that one day he will leave his wife and she um, is still left in anticipation waiting for him to to make this change in his life and so in the sort of nightmarish way in the story it's always 11 a.m. it's like the time never changes it's like they're caught in this moment um, which which never ends and I thought it was particularly interesting interesting this one quote from the book um, which feels like it relates to the epigraph where she wrote um, the uh, the woman is describing the apartment that she's been bought and how um, it was sort of beautiful and expensive and lavish at first but now it's taken on a much more sour tone um, because of the breakdown of their relationship 
and she describes it as um, dim lit on the third floor, like a low level region of the soul into which light doesn't pe penetrate. Soft shabby furniture and mattress already beginning to sag, like those bodies in dreams we feel but don't see. And so it's almost like she's describing these nightmarish things which are emerging from her unconsciousness, which can't be controlled and which are sort of terrorizing her life in the same way that night gaunts um, are this sort of nightmare that was terrorizing H.P. Lovecraft. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's just so fascinating how in Joyce Carroll's short story, she plays upon these um, works of art from the past, which seem emblematic, um, particularly of a kind of like American sensibility of um, that's sort of Puritan in tone, uh, but which is inflected with all of these um, feelings of uh, guilt and remorse and like anger and superstition and prejudice. Uh, so we can like feel all these things coming through. And, uh, and I thought it was really interesting how A.M. Holmes um, wrote in this article, which just came out a few days ago that I happened to see online, where she was talking about, A.M. Um, Holmes, the writer, uh, was talking about uh, books of short stories which have really influenced and inspired her. And she was talking about Joyce Carol Oates in particular and praising her in her focus on detail and how she uh, can extrapolate from the smallest details an entire story and in a whole world. And so she describes it as, I imagine her as someone who can look at roadkill and tell us exactly what happened, what kind of car, who was driving, what their mood was, and how taken by surprise they were by what jumped out of the dark. She is like a detective of the soul. And so I think um, these short stories like really show that in that she can pick out these details and then extrapolate this whole story from it, which is um, obviously just one take on how you can interpret another work of fiction, but which is quite a like interesting um, interpretation of uh, how that story might play out of um, this artwork. So um, it's, it's starting to rain now, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to um, wrap up for now. Um, and I'd only read the first um, story of this collection. So um, after I read more of the stories, um, I'm going to give more of my reactions to the stories and how the epigraph might relate to them. So I've now read the second story in this collection, which is called The Long-Legged Girl. And this is about a sort of middle-aged woman uh, living in New Hampshire with a professor husband. And the woman feels increasingly insecure about her body and her marriage to her husband. She uh, sort of always feels that her husband has been chasing after these blonde girls, these blonde younger girls who uh, go to the college and who he teaches. And uh, she particularly focuses on this one girl who feels like uh, the current threat to her. And it, uh, the story begins with her making tea um, for two people. And she's sort of mixing these um, ground up pills into the tea uh, along with a bit of uh, cleaning liquid. Um, so to make a kind of poison. And she sees it as a kind of Russian roulette that uh, the tea might kill her and it might kill the person she's having tea with. And um, she has this long conversation with this, this blonde girl, this long-legged girl, um, who she sees as the threat. And uh, yeah, so she describes how like she's this sort of nemesis, um, this faceless nemesis. And in, in one section she um, describes how her long straight silver blonde hair fell about her face shimmering like a falls. And so again we have this sort of image of um, this, this other um, being this other like creature that's like a threat to um, the the person that's at the center of the story and so I think that's like continuing on with this sort of image of night gaunts of this other being who becomes an a manifestation of um, somebody's anxiety and fears and uh, and in a way which because you're doing it to other people is a way of like denying them their humanity in a very scary way and so it's like the um, the unconscious and the conscious mind are sort of becoming blended or fused in a in a very dangerous way which will like encourage this sort of violence of um, people not being able to see each other as they actually are and she describes how uh, in one section she felt the rapid eye excitation of REM sleep an involuntary tug of her eyeballs so that she was seen to her dismay 
the long-legged blonde girl on a sidewalk or in the street, or on her bicycle hurtling past, like the Greek goddess of the hunt Artemis. And so, yeah, it's how, like, she's, she's really not seen her there, and she's having this long conversation with her, where um, in some sections you get some of the girl's dialogue, where it sounds like she's actually like had a hard time and is in an, is a state of distress but the um the woman at the center of the story doesn't really hear that she just like blanks that out and imagines she's just this privileged girl who's trying to seduce her husband and uh so yeah i i found it really interesting the way um the uh people are making demons of each other in these stories and also there's a section i i just want to read um which i think is really interesting carrying on from the um, sort of dodgy uh, racism of H.P. Lovecraft, how um, she specifically cites how the woman begins to feel so isolated that she goes online to seek comfort um, in groups of like white supremacists and even though she acknowledges that they're like ridiculous and so she says how uh, in, in a way of sort of making fun of um, this online group of white supremacists, she says um, these people are deluded, mostly male, who seemed sincerely to believe that there is something inherently valuable, God-ordained, about an attitude so trivial as the hue of their skin. And so I like how she's sort of poking fun at this um, online group of white supremacists, um, while also showing how this woman is so sort of desperate that she um, sort of goes on and says like, well, there's all these things wrong in my life, but you know, at least I'm white. As, as a way of just saying that she's like grasping at straws to try to find some sense of belonging because she feels like her life is so chaotic. So uh, yeah, that's the next story in this book. So I am back in London again, um, as you can see. Uh, it was just raining a little bit ago, but it's sunny now. Um, so I read the next story in this collection, which is called Sign of the Beast. And it's about an adolescent boy um, who's very shy and quiet and uh, who gets a new Sunday school teacher um, that's very domineering and sort of like pesters him. And, uh, and I thought this story was really interesting because um, it sort of shows how uh, the boy like makes of the teacher a sort of um, antagonist uh, who uh, sort of teases him and who, uh, but he's also, who he's also sort of drawn to because he's an adolescent boy, he's um, going through sexual changes. And uh, there's this section which um, describes specifically um, his uh, relation to sort of like his dreamlike self when um, he describes how uh, in the night my hands would move of their own volition to touch myself in ways that were forbidden and Mrs. S laughed at me and pushed at my hands when I tried to keep them away saying oh how ard aren't you a bad boy a very bad boy we know what a bad boy you are how ard and don't pretend and I loved how um, he sort of she sort of repeats um, the way that the teacher uh, says his name like it's Howard, but um, she she gives a space in between Howard um, to sort of like tease and antagonize him, and uh, it becomes a sort of like mystery story um, where the boy feels simultaneous sort of like guilt and shame um, for uh, sort of no reason at all, and uh, yeah, so it's a sort of another interesting example of the way. Um, people sort of demonize each other but are also made into a demon because um, it's called Sign of the Beast because he has a birthmark on his cheek and that's seen almost like as a, a sign of the devil. So I just read the fourth story in this um, collection of six short stories um, called The Experimental Subject and you know something I love so much about Joyce Carol Oates's writing is how wildly uh, imaginative it is like so often uh, it this uh, this story um, is like really outrageous and perverse in like quite a surprising way uh, but also really meaningful and thoughtful so the story concerns a woman at a university who's a nursing student that comes from a lower class background and she's targeted as the experimental subject in this scientific experiment of this group of um, scientists at the university and uh, she's particularly targeted by this um, one junior um, scientist uh, who's just called N, um, whose full name isn't given because he's Asian and um, it's sort of self-consciously uh, withheld um, in this way because it's assumed that most Americans won't know how to pronounce his name and also it's not said what Asian country he comes from. Um, a lot of this story is about how 
uh, he's sort of seen as this Asian stereotype, both by the girl that's chosen as the experiment and um, by the scientists who work with him. And, um, and the story, yeah, is really all about the, the conflict of the way people see each other in these stereotypes. So um, the, the um, girl from a lower class background is assumed to be uh, not very bright and who's um, physically described in quite like a grotesque way and in a very insulting way. And uh, these are like some of the main concerns in a lot of Joyce Carol Oates's fiction is about race and classism. And uh, yeah, and she shows the conflict of these things in, uh, in this really dramatic story. And, um, and, it, and it relates to um, the, the H.P. Lovecraft in that um, out of this conflict between these different people um, comes this being who's um, sort of faceless, whose face we see a bit of, um, and who's sort of this, this monstrous creation, uh, but who also, like, uh, is an innocent. And so it's sort of the two sides of the coin of um, that, uh, that monstrousness and innocence. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really dramatic story um, that I could really easily see becoming a film. So um, I'd be really interested to see if this story is ever developed. Um, yeah, and I, I, I was gripped by it. So the next story in this collection is called Walking Wounded. And it's, uh, it relates to H.P. Lovecraft in um, a few different interesting ways. It's about a man who's just called L. We don't get his full name. And he's a survivor of cancer um, who's undergone massive chemotherapy treatment, uh, which has left him massively disfigured. Um, he has to have a colostomy bag. He's, his body is really misshapen. And, and uh, he's a man who's only in his early 40s. And he moves back to his hometown uh, to try to settle down and have some peace and quiet and isolation. And also to work on a manuscript uh, because he's, it's sort of been bequeathed to him that he finished editing this manuscript by a great biographer um, who never got to finish it before um, he finished, before he died. And, uh, and it's this big mess of a manuscript that he's, that he, that he, that he thinks is really repetitive and not very good. And uh, so it's this sort of nightmare situation that he's caught with this. And uh, he keeps seeing in this town, uh, which he sort of has gone back to and inhabits like a, a ghost-like figure himself. Uh, he sees this uh, silvery haired woman in different places in this very haunting way. And it's not certain whether uh, she actually exists or not. And we never really see her face. And so again, we have this image of a faceless woman because uh, a lot of the time her hair is obscuring her face. And so in, uh, in one, one section, it describes how uh, her long tangled hair falls forward, hiding her face, which seems to him an aggrieved face that we cannot see it clearly. And so again, there's this figure, uh, uh, like a faceless figure that's sort of haunting him and that he, uh, he feels attracted to, but he, he knows that can never be reciprocated because, or at least he feels like he knows it can never be reciprocated because he's so ashamed about uh, the dilapidated state of his body after the intense treatment. And, uh, and so, yeah, she becomes this, this figure of beauty, um, uh, but also this figure that starts to uh, persecute him, um, this another uh, antagonist type figure. And it's particularly interesting that he's suffering from cancer and he's a writer in his 40s uh, who wasn't very successful in the same way that H.P. Lovecraft was a writer in his 40s um, who wasn't particularly successful in his lifetime. And H.P. Uh, Lovecraft died from cancer, as I said before, uh, and this man uh, is suffering from cancer. So there are some curious parallels uh, along those lines. And, and I wonder if uh, Oates intended that or had H.P. Lovecraft in her mind when she was talking, when she um, was creating this story. But it's a very melancholy tale with a lot of ambiguities. Um, I love how there's all these wonderful ambiguities and Oates stories, but also it's interesting how it considers the, the question of success and, and what makes someone successful and how uh, some writers and artists might just not have been successful because of circumstances in their lives. But also the, the question of love, and there's this one other haunting passage I want to read uh, quickly where he's, he's contemplating the um, state of love and he's recalling this instance from his childhood where someone fell into a sinkhole 
And so he, he muses how uh, thinking how doomed love is a sinkhole. He will fall and fall and never come to the bottom of the sinkhole. And if he cries for help, no one will hear. There is no one. And I love how that sort of reflects the way the woman in the story, she might be there and she might not be there. So it's a really poignant and thoughtful tale. So I didn't know that the title story would actually be about this, but I should have guessed that uh, the title story actually called Night Gaunts uh, would be about H.P. Lovecraft himself, uh, because, you know, Joyce Carol Oates has written about the lives of authors uh, quite a few times before, um, most notably, as I talked about in the last tag video that I did about um, contemporary authors writing about classic authors' lives, where in uh, her collection Wild Night she wrote about uh, the imagined uh, end of lives of Emily Dickinson and Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, so here she writes about H.P. Lovecraft's, uh, mostly about his early life and his childhood and the trauma of his father dying when his father was uh, put in a mental institution and his uh, death when uh, he was a young boy and then the death of his mother and his development how um, a lot of this trauma was like internalized and made into these demons and how it uh, inset these prejudices inside of him that were instilled upon him by his father uh, against other races and against Jewish people and uh, and how uh, these demons um, started to uh, plague him that he labeled night gaunts and uh, it was it's really interesting how the the only way uh, he he's sort of able to stop these night gaunts from terrorizing him is by writing about them and um, by externalizing this imaginative world that's sort of clashing around inside of his head and uh, so she describes um, how he does this really poignantly of how he discovers his grandfather's pen uh, by um, and his grandfather's library and how he reads all these ancient texts like Dante's Inferno and how that really like fires his imagination and as the final story it just like beautifully brings the collection together because I can feel the lives of all these characters sort of uh, how they, you know, all these uh, internalized fears and anxieties, how they're uh, projected out into the world onto other people in a very dangerous way, uh, in a very violent way. And so it brings together uh, the collection so well and the, the epigraph, the, the poem that started this whole collection. Uh, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed doing this tag and thinking about the way an epigraph might give an insight into an entire textbook where, you know, quite often we'll just read an epigraph at the start of a book and and sort of forget about it uh, but there's so much you can find out about it and I really think it is like an, a lens through which uh, the, you can understand the author's intentions for a book uh, so I hope you'll consider doing the epigraph tag as well and I'll put the the full poem in the description below and links and all that good stuff but I'm sorry um, this tag has gone on way longer than I intended it to uh, when I start talking about Joyce Carol Oates I just can't shut up uh, so I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you're doing well and happy reading everyone